right, welcome everybody. So we're now on week eight, case seven. So this is the second part of a series of cases from Dr. Dolan, um, which tie in very nicely into the week, um, both about immunology and also especially this week about antibiotics um, that Dr. Fisher and I are um, teaching to the students. So in this particular case, um, it is a pediatric case. Uh, we have a seven month old who's developed an upper respiratory infection, cough, episodes of diarrhea. Um, he's had a history of um, infections. Um, in this case, the tympanic membranes are abnormal. Chest x-ray is consistent with pneumonia. He's currently being treated with amoxicillin. Um, so have patient or have students think about, you know, is that the appropriate antibiotic in this case? Is it going to cover the bugs that are consistent, especially in a seven month old? Mm -hmm. So is this the appropriate medication for that patient? Um, and then it's a follow up uh, because the patient still has cough and diarrhea that has continued. Um, in terms of associated symptoms, um, there is some redness of his mouth and tongue with white spots and a severe rash in the um, perineal area and several loose stools, which especially about that last part, not too abnormal because he has had many days of diarrhea, which can increase the possibility of severe diaper rash. And then it has a little bit more information about the cough, you know, describing it as non-productive. As of right now, no fever, difficulty breathing. He is tugging at his ears, which is obviously a sign of an ear infection for uh, young patients. Um, but other than that, no other additional information that's pertinent. And the diarrhea, I mean, the other thing to think about, too, is amoxicillin is classic for causing causing diarrhea in kids. Mm -hmm. So did he get amoxicillin for a URI and then get diarrhea? Or, is you know, it, we don't have all the details of this, but certainly it's a good thing to emphasize that there's a lot of antibiotic overuse in children of this age. And that's actually why probably pneumonia in you... Typically, you wouldn't see pneumonia in quotes. The reason they're putting that in quotes in this case is diagnosing pneumonia by chest x-ray in a very young child is very subjective. Mm -hmm. So it's much more based on the clinical presentation than it is on the chest x-ray findings, which can often be quite subtle in these young children who aren't overwhelmingly sick. And so, again, they're giving the patient antibiotics, but they haven't truly, and the the point of this part is they haven't truly identified a clear bacterial etiology of any of this. Um, and, you know, so the question should come up, is the treatment actually contributing to the disease or are they appropriately treating this? And that will come back as we talk about the article as well. Mm -hmm. Then um, a pregnancy history. And just to emphasize here, the G2P1 refers to the mother when she was actually pregnant with um, our patient. So if there's some discrepancy there. Um, that's the reason why uh, that's G2P1. So overall, everything relatively normal um, in terms of um, when he was born, uh, breastfed well until four months of age. What you'll find, though, is that on the four month, six month and even now, um, his weight and his height are not increasing as they normally would. And so the students may start to think um, of what we call failure to thrive. So they may start to, you'll want to make sure either they calculate it through a calculator or bring up um, the CDC chart about where he should be at at seven months and mm -hmm. kind of even uh, kind of look at a trend to see where he's going for that. Yeah, so definitely plotting his growth on the growth chart is a really valuable exercise for the students to do here and kind of look at what, you know, what, what in terms of percentile of height and weight, what he falls into for each of these and why tracking it over time might be helpful. Now, an, an interesting, not necessarily twist, but um, a part of this case, uh, this is actually based on a real patient um, next door. And the father in this case was an ordained minister. And he um, states during this um, individual stay that he's praying for his son's cure. And as we go through the um, case itself, he also asks for pastoral services to set up kind of praying over his child. So that's kind of one of the psychosocial issues that we want the students to explore. You know, how, how religion and spirituality intersect with health and well-being. And also in this case, um, in this case, the religion doesn't necessarily dictate or have the um, 
the patient's parents choose any particular way to treat the child. They, they put the child's health in the um, physician and the uh, health care team's hands. But the students might want to look at, there's been several cases in the news where, you know, uh, parents will attempt to withhold life-saving treatment from, uh, from their kids. So might want to have the students explore that a little bit. And probably also at this point, you know, the, the parents obviously have some suspicion that there's something more than just recurrent colds going on. Sure. So the father clearly has a sense that there's something else going on with their their young child. Um, as it says, they have, you know, they have a three-year-old daughter who's, who's otherwise healthy. And so there's clearly a difference between what they're seeing of how the first seven months have gone with their, their oldest child versus this child. And so they probably are coming in with some trepidation and some concerns ahead of time. And students certainly could talk about what's it like as you deal with family who know there's something wrong, but they aren't sure what it is. And how do you approach that um, being sensitive to the cultural, social, religious implications of that that different families bring? And then we have an abbreviated review of systems. So um, not, not a lot of information provided there, but um, once again, really the uh, respiratory um, items and also the ab abdominal symptoms that the patient, patient's parents described are pertinent to this case. Okay, so then obviously there's several symptoms that we want the students to explore an actual differential to. So the first of which um, we provided is an algorithm for failure to thrive. Um, so have students think about, you know, what's going on here? Is it something that's happening in the home? Is it some type of CNS problem and maybe malabsorption? Is there some type of metabolic disorder going on? So there's a lot of different areas that they could explore about why he's not gaining weight and also growing appropriately. We don't necessarily have an algorithm, but um, have students think about um, maybe what would be the etiologies of the diarrhea, like um, Dan talked about, is amoxicillin causing this or is it from something else so like rotavirus? So you want to have the students kind of explore that. And then obviously a, a basic workup of a cough in an infant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's lots of different, this is a great time to, if, if your group is one that tends to fly through things, this is a great time to slow them down. What's the differential of diarrhea in a seven month old? What's the differential of cough in a seven month old? What's the differential of of red, you know, red tympanic membranes in a seven month old? Then there's there should be a differential for each of those. And as you build multiple things, then you start to think about is there something more systemic? If they have multiple problems going on, maybe there's something that's beyond just a un single system being involved. Mm -hmm. And we have our physical exam, um, which, as the um, part of it explains, so the patient um, himself is, looks relatively thin and ill-appearing um, while sitting in the mother's lap. Um, overall, um, like Dan had talked about, so the tympanic membranes are red, so we're thinking about, you know, the patient was tugging on his ear, so a, a high likelihood of possibly another um, uh, ear infection. Um, the white plaques that were described and lesions on the tongue. Um, and then in terms of the abdomen, so the hyperactive bowel sounds, which um, go along with the diarrhea that the patient is experiencing. And then a better description of um, what the rash looks like. Um, I love the description, beefy red. So the students might explore, you know, what, although it is rather descriptive, they might want to um, look up, you know, the use of the term beefy red to describe a rash. What does that mean? And different types of diaper rash too. Yes, so different another, types of diaper rash. So absolutely. there there are traditional just kind of contact, just irritation diaper rashes. There can be actually candidal diaper rashes and they do have slightly different appearances at times. And so certainly there are reasons that this child might be susceptible to either of those things. And so just Discussion about diaper rash, that's really valuable as a clinician because parents will ask you all the time as a medical student, as you walk into the kid's room, it's like, what is this diaper rash? So very relevant, I think, to their to their clinical practice. Again, I think this is a helpful case that illustrates why 
the history can give you a differential. So we haven't examined the patient. We can do a differential just based on the history. The physical exam reveals additional findings that weren't obvious on the history. So now we have these lesions in the tongue and the buccal mucosa. That changes our concept a little bit. The child actually looks ill appearing as opposed to just looking like a nice, healthy seven month old infant. So my differential is already shifting just as I get through the physical exam. All of a sudden I go from initially, I think, okay, well maybe this is just a child who kind of tends to get recurrent upper respiratory infections because their three year old sister is bringing home everything she can from, from daycare. Now I'm starting to worry that maybe he's a little bit more chronically ill it's just based on this exam. So their differential should change and they should talk about how, okay, this physical exam helps me start to think about the case a little bit differently compared to just getting the history. Um, so we have growth curve. Obviously, again, this is a good, you know, it's, if they didn't do it before, definitely please have them find the growth curves on the CDC and actually someone should plot this, this child on that growth curve. Mm -hmm. I think we talked about all of these kind of different areas here, but lots of great, great questions in regards to kind of this initial presentation of the patient. Yep, and um, just to emphasize there, you know, this is now case seven. So hopefully the students, um, for one of the questions where, you know, what additional studies? So hopefully at this point, students are really starting to think critically about what they want to order and why. So obviously we ask them those questions in all of the cases, but the hope would be that in this case, they really start to think about, all right, what do I want next so that I can start to <clears throat> determine if there's, um, something more pathological in this case. Um, as Dan emphasized, is it just a series of um, infections that this individual just keeps getting, or is there something um, more patholog pathologic there? And obviously we're in immunology, and so the students probably will pick up on this. And so this part of the faculty guide where we have this screening evaluation for primary in immunodeficiency, I'm guessing that most of your groups are going to, by this point, come down to, oh, we think this child has some immune deficiency. And so this is a good time to kind of ask them to think through, well, how do you work up a primary immunodeficiency in a seven month old? What are the steps? What do you think about? So we kind of, Dr. Dolan's kindly provided kind of a really step by step of what you go through in this. Now, if for some reason your group just totally missed that and they're on board with this is a pneumonia, you can, you don't have to slam them with this here. By the time they get to part two, this is gonna become even more clear that the child has immunodeficiency. So you could save this question for part two if you feel that your group is kind of just going down the, the rabbit hole. They really wanna kind of investigate just each of the individual symptoms. That's okay to let, the, let them go. At some point we want them to get to immune deficiency, but this is a perfect example where you as a facilitator have some discretion of, do you want to bring this in now or do you feel like your group would benefit better if that comes in a little bit later? Obviously, if you're passing this off from a, a morning session and you think that this is better held to the afternoon session, it's really important that you communicate that to your afternoon co-facilitator. If you say, well, we didn't really touch on this, please, you know, I left this because they weren't quite there yet, please kind of touch on this. So that's this page definitely is something that should be touched on. Whether you do it session one or session two is really up to you and your group and kind of how they progress. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And then moving on to part two. So the journal article for this week is the basic recommendations and assessment of a, the management of cough in children. So it's the probably the first set, of, correct me if I'm wrong, Dan, I think mm -hmm. it's the first guidelines that we provide yeah. um, to the students to start to look through. Now in that case, because it's guidelines, several of these components that we list here, the students should be able to answer. Um, however, you know, maybe something like um, actual results, like critical findings, they may not be able to find in there and that's okay. They could just use this as a guide and summarize what they found. Um, this is obviously um, one of the symptoms that, that the patient has. So the nice thing is that we, at least in this case, we didn't necessarily have uh, an article that says skids, so we're not giving away the diagnosis um, before, you know, basically the end of the week. So hopefully that, in, at least in this case, makes this um, um, particular patient case a little bit more um, of a mystery. Yeah. But we are in the immuno 
or immunology week, so who knows? <laughs> and we're trying to build a repertoire of cases. I've had a couple of faculty say, well, I don't like some of these articles. They just seem weird. We're trying to build a repertoire of different types of evidence that students are going to encounter. So they, they will encounter randomized controlled trials, but they will be expected to look at guidelines, interpret guidelines, understand how guidelines are made and how they're based on other articles and other evidence. And so more and more clinical care is really being influenced by guidelines that are put out and there are more and more guidelines to, to come out. So we want students to interact with a, with a guideline and think about, okay, well, how did this, our initial evaluation of this patient, how did the provider fall into the guidelines or not? So obviously we are in coronavirus <laughs> constantly. And so this, you know, the students may jump on, okay, well, we certainly would think about COVID in this case. And that's probably not completely unreasonable, although a seven month old would be, it would be unusual even now. But let's try to point the students away from that and also realize that these guidelines were written pre-COVID. Um, and so understanding that there is a fairly well-established guideline of kind of how you might approach a child with a cough and how that might help you in your clinical practice as you potentially could see hundreds or thousands of kids with cough if you end up in a primary care specialty or emergency medicine or pediatrics. And so we want the students to kind of realize that those guidelines are out there to help them clinically, but they are based on evidence. Mm -hmm. And so then uh, the first part back is actually, um, so obviously additional labs are drawn and um, the patient's father asks if he can speak to someone to pray over his son. So for this week, we actually um, are so excited to have uh, Reverend Dr. Jeff Flowers talk to the students at the wrap-up. Um, so they will, they can explore what's available um, both at the medical center and the uh, children's hospital. And it should be kind of re-emphasized and even expanded upon um, because we'll have Dr. Flowers come and talk to the students for that case. All right, and then we finally receive some of our lab um, results. So in, in this case, so the white blood cells are low. So normally in, in an actual infection, you would, I mean, it, they can be low in some instances, but in most cases they are high. And you would see um, in, in several instances as well too, that you would see a, a left shift in the neutrophil bands, but this is not happening in this case. Um, and for he does he is slightly anemic um, so the students can once again explore this um, it's just a slight reduction in the hemoglobin and hematocrit so they should find that it's normal chromocytic the interesting thing is the additional information that's provided about the number of lymphocytes so dr dolan emphasizes this a lot in his lectures and also um, ties it into the um, the HMX um, module that they took. When you calculate this out, his bands, I'm sorry, his lymphocytes are incredibly low for what they actually should be. So the normal range is between 4,000 and 13,500, and his is at 752. So that should be at least a clue that something um, is happening here, that there's a deficiency in lymphocytes and also we'll see here that it's a deficiency in immunoglobulins and if you look up earlier in the case guide actually dr dolan kind of specifically mentions this fact that he really wants the students to to walk away with which is don't just look at these percentages yep. and say oh well it's just, percents are right about normal you he, he really emphasized actually have the students walk through how do you calculate based on knowing that it's there's 16% lymphocytes. How do you actually calculate the absolute lymphocyte count? So you can see here that 16% might not look too bad compared to 25%, but when you actually do the absolute lymphocyte calculation, it's remarkably low. And so mm -hmm. this absolute calculation is really what he wants the students to focus on rather than just looking at the percentages that come back in the, in the uh, CBC. And then overall, um, so the complement screen is normal, HIV is normal. We do have a positive result for the rotavirus, which is increases the likelihood that this is not necessarily based on the use of amoxicillin, but it's from rotavirus itself. 
and then the final levels here that were obtained are all of the it's an immunoglobulin panel. So we're looking at IgG, IgM, IgA, and IgE. Um, in this case, the first three have come back and IgG is remarkably low and the other two are slightly low. So this should start to clue the, the students in that um, this likely is um, um, the SCID um, case. And so lots of good questions for discussion. Mm -hmm. Um, again, positive rotavirus, and this is a very kind of a, a pretty interesting thing to think about. So, and in this child, because they are immune deficient and they were vaccinated with a live vaccine, they actually are now infected with rotavirus because of the vaccine. And so that's kind of a, yes, they are, they do have rotavirus, but it was an iatrogenic etiology. And so mm -hmm. thinking about how sometimes we can actually harm people if we don't have the the full picture so. Mm -hmm. so so lots of good i think lots of good um points of discussion here mm -hmm. and then especially about what are next steps yeah so um you can dr dolan talks about lymphocyte flow cytometry um so that they can take a, a deeper look into this um, if skids is strongly suspected, um, they can talk to a genetic counselor um, and get some more information there because it is, from my understanding, excellent. I could be wrong though. I know it has some type of, um, obviously, genetic component. Um, all right, and then, um, oh, and then it goes into, for suspected, what measures should be taken prior to any type of stem cell transplant. And then what we'd like the students to do is um, actually read this article, which we'll have available to them. And if you scroll over that, it will take you directly to it. And it's about David Vetter, um, which who I think was the original bubble boy <laughs> or something like that. Um, and so it's an article about the kind of trials and tribulations and um, some interesting thoughts by a patient who has it. Um, so, and it go, dives deep into the psychosocial and ethical issues within the case. Mm -hmm. All right, and then for on to part three. So any of those areas that they needed to explore a little bit more, um, students can have the opportunity to describe that to their group um, starting Friday morning. And then we get some final results about the lymphocyte flow cytometry, which um, hope would be that they had asked for that. And so it gives some markers on um, different lymphocytes. So no cells on CD uh, or no markers for CD3. Um, of those studied, 99% of the cells had the CD19 and only 1% had CD16. And so then Dr. Dolan goes in a description of kind of what that means. And so that is leading them down the path that this is a likelihood of a patient with SCIDS. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's basically additional evaluation about genotyping and seeing whether they have a particular um, gene that is defective. Mm -hmm. And so these are, there isn't a lot of information in terms of quantity, but in terms of these are, on Friday, these are things that students could start to piece together. They've now had most of their immunology lectures and all the HMX modules so they should start to kind of be able to piece this together a little bit more and go a little bit deeper, even though there's not a lot of information on the, for this Friday session, these, this should take a fair amount of time for them to talk through this. And this would be a great time to go through, okay, what did you, what did you learn about immunology? What did you, what do you know so far? What are your, your learning gaps? What are your deficiencies? How are you going to, if you didn't understand half of this stuff, you should by now, and then how would you go about what is the next step in kind of helping you fill the whatever gaps you have in terms of understanding this. Immunology gets very complicated very quickly. Mm -hmm. And so this is a good time for the students to kind of see how they feel about kind of where they are in their in their level of knowledge. All right. And so the final thing is he does have a mutation that's X-linked. So I was correct there in the beginning. Um, he has the IL-2RG gene, a mutation in that particular gene, which basically doesn't allow um, his body to create the necessary antibodies and some other deficiencies, which makes him at a much higher likelihood um, to get all types of different infections. 
And because of that, this is also contributing to his failure to thrive because um, so they need treatment, like Dr. Dolan points out, immediately. Um, it's a true medical emergency, so patients need a bone marrow stem cell transplant as soon as possible. Um, and so and he goes into even the survival rates of that. Um, and basically, this patient was lucky um, because um, he talks about survival rates decline rapidly after six months. So it is wonderful that the patient was brought at that time period so that and they found out what was going on so that um, they can go ahead and treat him with a stem cell transplant. And that is the end of the case. Mm -hmm. And if we also, so in the student section, I, I have this art, particular article for them to look at. Um, it's on part three, so they're welcome to click on it. It's not the article that they need to evaluate for the case, but it provides the newborn screening for severe combined immunodeficiency and also different types of T-cell um, lymphopenias. All right, everyone, that's week eight.